Good. Uh, great. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to this, do this presentation today. Um, greetings from Ireland. Um, my name is Tony Johnston, and I'm Head of Department of Hospitality, Tourism and Leisure Studies in TUS. It's a university based in Athlone, right in the middle uh, of Ireland, um, just beside the little uh, red dot there in the, in the middle. And the presentation that I'm going to do today is about crisis management uh, in the tourism industry in Ireland uh, with a particular focus on the COVID-19 pandemic and the implications for how the government uh, industry and policymakers managed the tourism industry over the last 24 months. To structure this, I'll go through a bit of background about the context um, prior to the pandemic starting. I'll give some key literature around crisis management, some of the research aims and objectives, talk about the methodology and some analysis and a look to the future. Before I get into this, it's my obligation as every good Irish person to promote our country when we talk to people abroad. So I just want to tell you a little bit about where I live and work. Um, I live and work in Athlone, a town right in the middle of the country where we've got the oldest pub in uh, Europe, a pub that's approximately 1,100 years old called Sean's Bar. And this appears in the Guinness Book of Records for being very uh, old and historic. And it has archeological evidence of being on site from the year 900 AD. Ireland's a very beautiful country, as I'm sure you know. Um, if you've ever done any research about, about us, you know, we're a very wild and, and mystical and magical country with a very rugged and exposed coastline. Um, this is a, a photograph of Sleeve League in County Donegal in the northwest, which is some of the highest sea cliffs in, in Europe. Um, and this is the county that I uh, come from. We also, in our tourism product, have a very strong emphasis on protecting wild spaces. Uh, and although we're quite a small country and we have quite a dispersed population, we still have a very good protected night sky uh, in many places. And we have a, a strong industry um, for dark skies tourism, where people will come to photograph the Milky Way and to photograph the Northern Lights uh, and to get interested in things like astronomy. We also have a very strong outdoor um, tourism product um, with a big emphasis on um, protection of wildlife through our National Parks and Wildlife Service. So we have a good program with uh, golden eagles, for example, and also with basking sharks, porpoises, uh, mink whale, and uh, resource dolphin. So there's just quite a, a strong emphasis on ecotourism uh, in the country at the moment. Film tourism is a major product in Ireland as well. We have some major films uh, produced in, in both Ireland and in Northern Ireland, including um, TV series like Game of Thrones, uh, which is uh, very popular both for visiting film sets and also for visiting some of the experiential attractions associated with it. Uh, similarly for Star Wars, which has had many of the recent movies uh, have used many iconic locations in Ireland, including this UNESCO World Heritage Site called Skellig Michael, uh, which is an ancient monastery located off the coast of County Kerry, which features prominently on, on the recent Star Wars films. To give a little bit of further context uh, to what's happening in Ireland beyond what's happening in the tourism industry to, to give a kind of a bigger consideration of, of some of the social and economic issues. Um, in particular, uh, the biggest challenge in the country at the moment is around uh, housing provision. We have a, a quite chronic shortage uh, of housing in Ireland at the moment, which is partly due to supply chain and, and labor issues um, associated with the pandemic, uh, but also due to rising costs and inflation so that, that's quite a challenge, but I think that's probably not unique to Ireland. It's kind of a global challenge uh, at the moment around housing. There's also some uh, social issues around uh, provision of healthcare at the moment. Uh, again, probably not particularly unique there, but, but just to say it nonetheless. We've had a major issue ongoing over the last couple of years with um, Brexit, which was Britain's withdrawal from the European Union. So this was the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, which was our, our largest trading partner. Uh, and they were leaving a, a very open and free trading uh, liberal bloc um, to, to pursue their own kind of trade agenda in particular. And this has had many implications for things like taxation and movement of people and movement of goods over the last couple of years. We're also a country that's still living in the legacy of conflict. Um, we're a shared island with the Republic of Ireland uh, occupying about 80% of the island uh, to, the, to the south and Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom occupying about 20% of the island to the north. 
uh, and this legacy of conflict and um, kind of polarization of views that's happening in global politics has sort of resulted in a bit of a rise of populism uh, around some of the, the kind of major issues associated with the border and with, with cross-border working and cross-border living. We're also uh, going through a cost of living crisis here at the moment where we have a very high inflation uh, running at around 7% at the moment. So costs are, are getting really high and there's increased labor charges and so on. And all of these things affect the hospitality industry greatly, as you can imagine. So it costs more for hotels to employ their staff. It costs more them, for them to buy their food um, and their provisions and so on uh, to, to run their, their um, establishments. You may see Ireland featuring occasionally in the news also in relation to international taxation rates. And um, we've long been a very low tax economy. So we attract many foreign direct investment uh, companies to Ireland um, and we don't charge them a particularly high tax when they come here. So as a result, we have some of the world's major companies have their European bases in Ireland, including um, household names like Apple and Facebook uh, and LinkedIn and Google and so on, uh, would all have their European basis here, as well as many medical device companies, uh, such as Pfizer, uh, for example. We have many historical issues in Ireland relating to justice and governance and legacy of religion and the Catholic Church in particular. Um, th those are, uh, I suppose, a whole other narrative to, to today, but just to, I suppose, highlight them at the same time. And um, we also have many issues in, in the context of tourism around biodiversity, uh, environmental protection and sustainability. So lots of challenges there, again, like much of the world in terms of reducing our, our impact. Current challenges, as I'll talk about today, are around COVID-19 and the exposure of Ireland's economy to this. Uh, and finally, around refugees and Ukraine. And um, we currently have uh, our hotel industry experiencing very high occupancy rates. Uh, for example, which is a figure that's widely distorted by the hotels hosting a significant number of refugees. I, I think there's around 25,000 Ukrainian refugees currently in Ireland, um, for example. I'll move now to talking about COVID-19 and what happened over the last two years uh, in, in Ireland, because it's a very interesting case study in the context of tourism management and crisis management. Ireland had long been preparing for Britain leaving the United Kingdom and preparing for the shock associated with such. We expected this to be a major economic shock, um, but of course we prepared for one thing, but something entirely different happened. Brexit didn't turn out to be the economic shock that it was predicted to be, but COVID-19 came from nowhere. And suddenly we went from what was expected to be a record-breaking tourism year in terms of all metrics around international arrivals, um, bed nights, uh, income, contribution to GDP. Uh, and we went, we went from this to a total collapse of the industry in a very short period of time. So COVID-19 emerged in, in China, as you, you probably know, in late 2019. Um, and it was first confirmed then as arriving in Ireland about two months later at the end of February, uh, 2020. And what happened over the next couple of weeks was, was very striking. Um, we had a number of major sporting events. Uh, we had a number of major national festivals, such as St. Patrick's Day in, in mid-March, which were very promptly uh, shut and cancelled, and severe restrictions were placed on the hospitality industry, include, including closure of hotels uh, and restaurants, closure of all retail, closure of, of all tourism attractions nationally. And by the time we got into the middle of March, uh, we had closed down schools, and we'd imposed a very strict lockdown where people had to remain within two kilometers of their house uh, unless they were leaving for grocery uh, or urgent medical needs. So it was a very strict lockdown. One of the, the pervasive beliefs at the time was that COVID-19 was being tra transmitted primarily through air travel. Uh, and while of course that's how it originated and, and came into the country, um, it still circulated wildly among the, the population, even during the, the lockdowns. But this very strict approach to uh, closing the air routes um, went all the way through summer 2020, where most of the airlines either cancelled their flights uh, or operated ghost flights where they, they flew with no passengers um, because there were such stringent regulations put on them. 
throughout uh, autumn 2020 and into summer 2021, there was very tough legislation brought in by the government to restrict outbound travel uh, entirely. So for example, if you were to go to the airport and um, without a valid reason, such as um, you know an essential medical reason to travel abroad, you could be fined up to 2,000 euro um, if you were um, intercepted by the Gardaí or National Police Force. And there were many people um, were, were fined for this. Uh, as we moved forward through the summer last year, we had a very high vaccine uptake. Um, we had one of the highest vaccine uptakes in the world uh, for both the, um, the first and second dose. We were at one point running over 90% of the eligible population had, had received both vaccines. Um, and as we came into autumn, uh, I suppose the and as new variants of the the virus began to emerge, um, the country began to relax much of the legislation around travel. Um, although it did it did come back up a number of times as new variations emerged again and so on, but we ended up, I suppose, if we are considering that we're post pandemic now, um, we ended up with quite a high vaccine uptake and quite a low excess death or excess mortality rate. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. During the lockdown, we brought in uh, restrictions that were nationwide. So it was really regardless of where there were hotspots for the virus. And um, we just basically closed the entire country. The, the first thing that the government did was target uh, pubs, um, which was, I suppose, quite quite an obvious move in, in some ways, because most Irish bars are, are quite, quite small. They've quite um, densely um, uh, packed space when they're open. Um, they're quite intimate and people are quite close to each other. They tend to be quite old buildings, many of them with poor air filtration systems. Uh, and as a result, they were sort of deemed to be a, a sort of a hotspot for viral transmission. So bars, nightclubs, hotels, restaurants and attractions all closed very promptly. Of course, the government's fear when they did this was that people would, would simply socialize in households instead. So household visits were also immediately restricted and uh, were significantly restricted for a long period. We had an initial period of a couple of uh, months, I think it was about six weeks, two months maybe, of uh, a two kilometer radius restriction. Um, and this was eventually uh, expanded out to five kilometers. Um, and while all this uh, sounds very harsh, I suppose, and the restrictions were, were quite well received in the first year as people were very unsure about what was happening in the context of the virus and so on. Um, and we were looking at, at Italy and we were looking at, um, at, at countries that were, were really suffering from, from the virus, including the United Kingdom and uh, later on the United States. Um, Ireland ultimately ended with one of the, the lowest rates of excess deaths in the world uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's a kind of a mixed, um, a mixed reaction to government policy in, in the country at the moment. People uh, many people feel that that their mental health was damaged, that they missed out on, on, on a huge period of time to spend with family over a couple of years and so on. But at the same time, the, the, the death rate was, was so low that we think maybe it wasn't the worst thing to have done. So there's, there's mixed views on that. And, and even within individuals, they'll have mixed views themselves. Of course, this absolutely decimated the tourism industry, though. Um, with you know an immediate closure of of uh, the airlines, the hotels, the the ferries, and so on, um, there was a significant number of redundancies. So just basically all of the major employers in tourism laid off their staff very promptly. The government, to be fair to them, were very um, concerned that this would create a, a labour gap whenever the industry eventually did reopen. So they brought in a system called the EWSS which was the Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme. And what they did with this was they wanted to retain a link between the employer and employee. So they told hotel groups and tourist attractions and transport providers and so on, please keep your employer or your employee on your books and please keep paying them and we will subsidize that cost to you. So we will give you money for you to pay your employee with so that when they do return to work, it's a natural return for them. For those who were laid off, there was a blanket payment of 350 euro per week uh, given to people. Um, and this payment persisted for 18 months uh, throughout the pandemic um, for those who hadn't returned to work or, or who couldn't return to work. And there were many sectors which, which simply didn't reopen for, for those 18 months, such as nightclubs, uh, for example. 
and many of the larger stadium and event and concerts. We also brought in unusually harsh restrictions for international travel, um, particularly in terms of mandatory hotel quarantine. And this existed for a significant period during 2021 uh, in spring, um, but persisted right through the summer for some countries. Uh, so some passengers arriving from um, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, um, the United States, Canada, the Middle East, and many EU countries uh, at various times were subjected to two weeks mandatory hotel quarantine. So they arrived in, in Dublin airport and were escorted to a, a state booked hotel by the army where they were um, quarantined in, in their bedroom with their meals brought to them on a daily basis for a 10 day or two week period, depending on how their COVID testing was going. Uh, this was very damaging to our international tourism reputation for a number of reasons, the, the, the harshness of it, I suppose, um, and of course, some of the media stories and associated social media commentary that went with it was quite damaging uh, in terms of profile and, and our usual, I suppose, quite soft and hospitality and open welcome that we would have. Uh, we had no non-essential travel uh, permitted an expectation of a uh, domestic travel season. I should say last year, apologies. So this was in relation to travel during 2021, where our outbound travel utterly collapsed for a significant period of time. So during 2020, our numbers were down 78%, uh, right back to levels last seen in the mid 1990s. And this had a huge, uh, da hugely damaging impact, of course, on our revenue uh, to the, the hotel sector in particular, which takes about 75% of its revenue in a normal year from international visitors. To mitigate this damage, the hotel industry was um, supplemented and supported and encouraged very much during 2021 with a major uh, piece of investment in developing an outdoor tourism market. So many of the hotels were given uh, small amounts of funding to do things like develop outdoor dining, for example, by converting patio spaces uh, or developing new outdoor attractions, such as a big emphasis on cycling uh, and walking tourism. Um, and also to stimulate the domestic tourism economy to stay here. You can see here just how striking the collapse was over the last couple of years. So this is a, these are figures from the January, February, March uh, period of 2019, 2020, and 2021. We don't have figures yet for 2022, but I, um, I, can, I can give you an indication of where they think they're going to look in, in a few moments. In 2019, we, we had, um, just over three and a half million people departing Ireland by plane uh, in those three months. Uh, and this dropped to just under three million in 2020. And those figures are really taken from just before the, the severe severity of, of uh, COVID was, was being realized. So those figures really relate to January and February. By 2021, you can see that they dropped down to uh, figures uh, just around, I think it was around 220,000. So you can see it was a 94% drop uh, in just a two year period. It's really astonishing, you know, and people often talk about volatility in tourism and, and here it is, you know, it's, it's a clear example of just how quickly uh, an industry can, can completely collapse. So just have a look at who, who did it impact. Um, the lockdowns uh, and the severity of the lockdowns, first of all, had a really striking impact on people who needed to travel to the United Kingdom. And the United Kingdom is a, is a crucial air route for Ireland. So we have in, in Ireland uh, an air connection between Dublin and London. And this air connection is among the top world international air travel connections between two cities. So I think it was it, it's frequently been the most traveled international flight route. Um, sometimes it's second or third. I think at the moment it's sitting around third. Um, usually it's, it's uh, either first or behind um, a connection between Taipei and Beijing. But this route, Dublin to London, has dozens and dozens of flights every day going over and back. And there's a long established social and economic in interdependence where people will even live in one state and, and fly and commute to the other or study in one or have relationships in, in the second and so on. So it had a really severe impact. Uh, and you can't underestimate, I suppose, the, the social impact this had on 
Ireland's national psyche to not be able to go between Dublin and London it was, it was a very damaging uh, issue. The second thing that it impacted was the, the scale of expenditure by Irish tourists uh, going abroad. We're a small country with only 5 million people, but we love to travel. And even though we're in Ireland uh, and you know we're on the west of Europe and on the margins of Europe, we travel hugely. Uh, many Irish people will travel abroad, particularly to Portugal and Spain uh, and France, um, but also really all over Europe. And we're high spenders. We spent over 8 billion euro uh, in 2019, for example, um, making 9.4 million outbound trips, which, you know, if you if you estimate that we had around 4.8 million people in Ireland in 2019, equates to nearly two international trips per person. Before COVID-19, we were a very large aviation market as well. We have very big seat capacity. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because of our location in Western Europe. We have a very high um, number of uh, connecting flights coming through Ireland. So we, we have flights from the United States, for example, which do stopovers in Ireland before traveling on to the Middle East, for example. Or we have many airlines from places like uh, Qatar, Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Ethiopia that will utilize Ireland uh, as a stopover point uh, on the way to the US. Uh, but this completely collapsed over, over this period um, and, and we fell down from where we were ranked at 16th in, in the aviation market right down to 23rd, um, which was a very significant slump from pre-COVID. The impact was also quite severe on people who lived abroad. Um, the Irish uh, love to travel and um, uh, there's many Irish living overseas um, and, and this made it very difficult for people to, to, to come home. I have a very good colleague, for example, uh, who's who's living abroad and simply hasn't been able to travel back um, for a three year period now uh, due to COVID-19 restrictions. So you, you can see the social impact uh, as well. So the key literature that I, I used to kind of inform what I'm doing here was, first of all, around exposure to crises. Tourism is a really volatile industry. And I think anybody going into the hospitality and tourism industry needs to be very aware that this is an industry that's it's exposed to shocks. And we, we see them all the time, whether it's uh, COVID-19 uh, or Brexit or the current Ukraine crisis, or going back over the last couple of decades, uh, things like the, the September 11th crisis um, or some of the various um, uh, uh, natural disasters like the, the tsunami in Asia in 2004 or Hurricane Katrina uh, in New Orleans and so on. So it's an industry that, that's very exposed, uh, but it's a very resilient industry. It typically rebounds after a crisis and it typically rebounds to a level that was greater than what was seen before the crisis. And all of the literature on, on crisis management and exposure of tourism to, to crises in tourism reinforces that point. The second um, point is around resilience and volatility. So resilience is a kind of an ecological concept and this is about how um, a threat can be conceptualized and how uh, a phenomenon can adapt and rebound based on on pressure and these ecological models are really useful in tourism because it, it's as i said a, a sector that just has this characteristic built into it and i don't know if it's the infrastructure or the volumes of money or the contribution to the economy um, that, that really configure this, or my own personal belief is it's the kind of people that are attracted to it. Many of the people who want to work in tourism are very hospitable by nature, and they, they're very good in dealing with different situations and adapting. So, so tourism does tend to bounce back. And finally, the, the last set of literature I used was around some of the historical pieces, just to, to kind of give a bit of context. COVID is something new, yes, but crises uh, aren't. These are something we see in, in tourism all the time. That said, very little has been written ever about the Irish experience um, of crises, um, apart from in the context of conflict in Northern Ireland. And uh, there was a very kind of big literature gap here, particularly in terms of Irish outbound tourism, um, which is a significant industry, um, as, I, as I mentioned, in terms of, of scale. So what I wanted to do was look at the, the three factors that were really influencing this. 
and I've hinted at them all here so far, the legal, the industry and the societal frameworks which contributed to the collapse of this, this sector. So I conducted a piece of research, basically reviewing all of the secondary information I could gather from an 18 month period going from February 2020 up until July 2021. At July 2021 was a key point uh, in, in this crisis management because it was a point where we introduced a digital COVID certificate as part of a European framework to reopen the travel industry uh, in a safe way post the pandemic or at, I, what we would hope is towards the later end of the pandemic at least. Um, and this certificate allowed um, people to travel freely between countries with no quarantine um, or reduced restrictions placed on them. Uh, on the basis that they had previously had COVID, that they had a vaccine, or that they had a negative COVID-19 test. And it was a very successful document, I think, in that it, it began to reopen the industry quite quickly. So we all have a QR code on our, on our phones, um, which we can utilize for travel, albeit that most countries in Europe no longer require it, um, either uh, legally or in practice. So the different pieces of data that I gathered up uh, came from our legal restrictions. Um, you can see the long technical legal law names there. Um, I also gathered information from our, our police force, our COVID-19 data hub, um, the different European data sets and so on as well. I gathered information from our mainstream media publications, including Radio Telefisher and News, which is our main national TV broadcaster, the Irish Times and the Independent and so on, and some international uh, outlets. Our official data sets from Falch Ireland, um, that's our National Tourism Development Authority, Tourism Ireland, which is our National Tourism Promotional Body, our Central Statistics Office and our European Stats Office and various others um, from industry, uh, including our largest airlines and port authorities and so on. So the, the findings I had from this were categorized into three measures, legal decisions, industry decisions and society and media response. And yeah, some of these are technical, but I think you'll find some of them quite amusing as well, particularly the societal ones where, where people were, were quite, I, I suppose, um, underhand at getting around the restrictions. So the, the first one was that we introduced this requirement for 14 days um, of isolation. Uh, this was the first kind of major piece of restriction on international travel. Um, but the government found that, that it was kind of largely being ignored because it was simply a stay at home request and it, it wasn't possible either um, technologically or socially or politically to actually implement this. So while it was being ignored, I suppose the virus was widely circulating in the country or, or perceived to be. So the government then brought in a rule that said anybody who goes uh, abroad um, must take a two week uh, unpaid holiday. Uh, if they're working for the state. So this quickly wiped out a significant proportion of people from traveling. Um, so all public servants, any teachers, uh, doctors, nurses, police force, et cetera, simply couldn't really travel during this period. At the same time though, COVID numbers began to decline greatly and regulations began to focus more on, on staying at home and, and they stopped trying to restrict international travel so much. Uh, so you can see the numbers that, of people that we had in hospital during this period um, as we went into 2021. We went from 500 people approximately at the start of January 21, trebling this to, to in a month period to 1500 in 2021. These numbers will look quite, quite small to people in the United States and so on, but bearing in mind all the time that we have a, a not particularly efficient health uh, service here and uh, we have quite a small population. Um, these were quite striking numbers to have in hospital with one single disease. The numbers uh, finally declined then in, in April um, uh, and throughout summer, um, albeit that they rose uh, slightly um, as, as the summer went on and new variants emerged and so on. But we began to test people differently and we began to become much less focused on um, actual cases per day and focusing primarily on two main metrics, which were fatalities and numbers of people in our intensive care units. But this is where the, the legislation began to come in. We, we brought in a hundred euro fine for people who left the five kilometer boundary around their home. This was then increased to 500 euro. And then that was further increased to 2000 euro 
for anyone who tried to travel for non-essential reasons outside the state. And these fines were extended right up into the middle of July uh, last year, long after there was any particularly high numbers of people um, with COVID-19. Even at the point where we only had 50 people in hospital with it, we still had a 2,000 euro fine. So strict was the government and so determined were they to reduce travel. We had um, a very strong media reaction to this and we had a very strong societal response. So for example, one of the pieces of legislation said that you were permitted to travel abroad if it was for a medical appointment. So we immediately had um, hundreds minimum and thousands is my estimate, uh, numbers of Irish holidaymakers making dentist appointments uh, in places such as Lanzarote, uh, Tenerife, the Canary Islands, the, the Balearics, um, and all across the Mediterranean. Um, dentists were booming from appointments from Irish holidaymakers because this gave them the freedom to travel um, from a technical and legal perspective. The second issue that came up, um, which was quite amusing, was that many Irish people would simply take a taxi into Northern Ireland um, and fly from Belfast, um, which was another way around the, re the regulations because they were departing from a different state. And there is never any political desire to acknowledge or enforce any border controls between Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So this was essentially an open back door. So while I'm talking about very harsh restrictions here, these harsh restrictions in many ways existed only on paper. All somebody had to do was book a tooth cleaning in the south of Spain and they were good to go. The government then decided though that they would make this even stricter and they would introduce a, a mandatory quarantine for anybody arriving in the country. And there was this was much more difficult for people to get around because it was a regardless of why you're traveling, you must stay for 14 days in one of our state owned or our state contracted hotels during this period. And this became very controversial because of course people tried to escape from the hotels or decided that they weren't going to comply. Uh, and these um, situations often escalated up into national media coverage. We also um, had a very high degree of skepticism at the time around the use of antigen tests. You may call these something slightly different uh, in the United States, but these are the, the the self-administered COVID-19 tests, which were used at home. Um, and we even had a, a very prominent scientist bring one of these into our national parliament and show that somebody could take one of these tests and easily manipulate it to get a negative result by rubbing butter on the test. We're not quite sure why anybody would try and do that. I think the only reason anybody would want to do these tests would be if they were wanting to find out whether they had it or not. Um, if they didn't want to know, they simply wouldn't take the test anyway. But you can see the level of discourse um, and conversation that was happening around this got, got quite um, uh, bizarre quite quickly. We then had um, many conspiracy theories as well around the Irish government's uh, desire to actually implement or support the state in, in traveling again. For example, they launched um, a, a website where people could request this QR code for traveling but they launched it with an incorrectly spelled uh, URL, um, which meant that anybody who tried to access the page was simply met with a blank blank website until some helpful citizens um, bought the page and redirected people to where the correct page actually was um, with the typo uh, in the title. That was all the government uh, legal and policy decisions around travel. There were also some industry decisions which quickly collapsed um, the sector as well. So this is looking at the figures from May um, of 2017, 18 and 19. And then you can see there was an enormous collapse in 2020 and this didn't really particularly recover in May, 2021. Um, now it has begun to recover in May, 22, the month that we're currently in. Um, and the early indications are that we're probably running at something like 60 to 70% of where we were in 2019. So the recovery is certainly on and it will be a very much a, a kind of a, a U shape or V shape in, in the recovery chart um, as we go into the future. But the industry decisions were largely configured by um, poor crisis management techniques from the airlines themselves. So Ryanair, for example, our, our largest airline that flies in here decided that they would cancel flights but not issue refunds 
uh, for many, many months. So many people didn't get refunded for their summer flights for the year 2020 for a six month period. And this was extremely frustrating and damaged consumer confidence. Nobody wanted to book flights again in case there were further closures and they would lose out on their money. We also had airlines making long-term strategic decisions about where they'd be based, such as closing routes um, and canceling um, connections uh, due to, I, I suppose, opportunistic reasons um, from the pandemic. These were, were closures that they had long hoped to make anyway, um, so that they could defer, divert flights or, or utilize lower cost wages in other countries. Um, the numbers began to lag behind um, the European average to, to a greater degree than they should um, throughout the summer 2021. Um, and we were about 40% below the 2019 average um, by summer last year. People really weren't happy about this at all, as you can imagine. Um, the media frequently blamed the high levels of COVID on travel. Um, people who traveled blamed COVID on people who didn't travel. Uh, everybody could blame some, someone else. Um, and, and this was evident on, on all of our national media. People who flew home for Christmas were blamed. Um, people who traveled to Cheltenham, a major horse race in the UK that, that attracts around 100,000 Irish people were blamed. People attending sport events, and concerts and so on overseas were blamed as well. So there was this kind of curtain twitching approach going on for, for a significant period of time that was very evident in the media. Um, and, and it was prominently covered in, in both the, the national broadsheets and in our tabloid press and on social media commentary uh, as well. We also um, focused in on, on individuals. Um, and I suppose this is a, a kind of an example of cancel culture um, at its extreme. So one of our um, national tourism authority directors traveled to visit his family overseas, for example, uh, during summer 2020. And when this was leaked out to the media, such pressure was put on him that, that he had no opportunity but to uh, resign his post. Um, and we, we lost, I think, many decades of, of uh, kind of strong international experience as a result. We had a very significant focusing in on, on people who refused to enter hotel quarantine as well. We had two women, for example, who traveled to Dubai for breast enlargement surgery. Um, and they were very focused in on by the media, um, particularly the tabloid press, um, because they wouldn't go into mandatory quarantine um, when they came back. And there were all sorts of questions then around, you know, what constitutes a medical essential issue um, and so on. So it got very um, heated in the media, I think would be the way to describe it. So the outlook uh, for the next um, period, I suppose, is that the travel collapsed in 2020 and it recovered somewhat in 2021, but a confused policy by the legal issues around mandatory quarantine, the technical travel issues around things like our digital COVID cert, and also statements such as the one made by our Deputy Prime Minister in spring last year, where he predicted that it may not even be possible to travel at Christmas, uh, weren't particularly helpful. But what's happened as we've gone into 2022 is that we have um, had such a successful vaccine rollout. Um, we have had such a, a major collapse in the numbers of people in hospital. And we still have quite high circulation rates of the, the virus, but people are largely ignoring it, I think, at the moment. There, we, have, we have no restrictions or regulations in relation to COVID at all anymore in the country. Uh, apart from that, you must wear a mask if you enter a hospital. And that's the only one remaining that I'm aware of. Um, so the outlook is quite positive, but the outlook was, of course, replaced by the conflict in Ukraine that, that uh, commenced in February. And this has created a very strange situation where a, a kind of a positivity that was coming back into the industry um, with, with great speed uh, has been somewhat diluted by what's happening um, in Ukraine. So these are the latest figures. These are from March 2022, um, where we, we can see two sets of figures here. Um, and the figures are comparing March 22 to March 19. So if you, if you look, for example, there at our arrivals into Ireland from North America, we had 90,000 arrivals in March 22. And this is down 45% on our arrivals from March 19. 
compare that though to our year to date figures, which is March 20, uh, sorry, March um, 19, going back 12 months and comparing, um, or sorry, the it's down 55% uh, for that one for 166,000 for North America. So you can see that the, there is recovery happening where we've gone from uh, a, a kind of a, a decline of 55% and we, we brought it back up to 45% over the last month. And you can see the V-shaped recovery that's happening in the graph here at the bottom. The, the decline from North America is still quite high at 45%. From the United Kingdom, it's much lower at 26. Continental Europe at 21 and rest of the world at 30%. Part of the reason the, the decline from North America is, is still so uh, severe is the travel restrictions for people returning to America after visiting here are still a little bit stronger than they are from people traveling around Europe. There's also, I think, probably lingering concerns uh, in, in American um, visitors' minds about traveling to Europe generally with the Ukraine crisis, albeit that it's far away. Many Ukraine or many American tourists that would visit uh, us here in Ireland would often do so as part of a wider European itinerary. And there may be a bit of hesitancy about booking um, there. So the government is taking a number of policy actions to try and stimulate this at the moment. Um, they've dropped the value-added tax rate, the VAT rate, from 13.5% to 9%, and they're using this to stimulate the industry by keeping costs low. Our hotel occupancy rates in March this year were back up to 73%, which is quite high for a shoulder season, but it at the same time is a figure that's somewhat distorted by the Ukraine crisis and the high number of refugees that are being accommodated in hotels. So it's very difficult to tell what is actually going on uh, in the sector at the moment. So if I was to put all of those issues together and look at the future and look at some recommendations, I think one of the first considerations I'd have is that the three bodies that I'm talking about in particular here, the media, the government, and the industry itself, need to be on the same page so that when there is a conflict they need to be able to discuss effective ways of crisis management so that they can reduce any public nature of the conflict or create any uncertainty or confusion in the consumer mind and this was evident in terms of arguments about antigen tests in terms of conflict about what constitutes essential travel and very much in terms of refunds for consumers post-travel so I think that that public nature needs to be reduced to rebuild consumer confidence, or at least to not damage it so much in the first place. Second is that it's imperative communications are improved in future crisis management situations in Ireland. So for example, if we're going to introduce hotel quarantine, that we would do so in a very considered and thought through manner where we are consulting and informing relevant stakeholders. For example, uh, ambassadors, um, from other states that our neighbours of ours should be consulted and discussed with before we implement such kind of draconian measures. Third, I think we also need to learn lessons in terms of how we respond. As I mentioned, tourism is a very volatile industry. Um, uh, it can go through shocks quite quickly and rebound quite quickly. And while we manage some aspects quite well, such as our employment wage subsidy scheme, and how we kept people in work and the connection between employer and employee quite strong, we do need to ensure that we can keep that link um, that, that link there and keep, I suppose, uh, a good flexibility in government in particular in how we respond. And fourth, I think post-crisis, we should sit and reflect and, and consider lessons. Um, we, we often have a habit of, of going through a crisis and then just jumping into the next crisis and then the next one and so on. But there is an opportunity right now uh, during these current months where we feel like we're post-pandemic that we need to sit and quantify some of the impacts of some of the decisions that, that were made in the state um, on, be, on be, uh, consumer behavior. So the conflict between airlines and the public arguing between um, the, the media and the public and the government about who was to blame for circulation of the virus and so on, that, that should all be quantified and, and examined so that the industry can be protected in future. And that's all from me. Um, thanks for listening. And please ask any questions. I know some of that was quite technical and I know I speak quite quickly. Um, so you, you may you may have, uh, you may need to, to look back on the recording and clarify any bits there, but happy to take any questions. 
I see there's one in the chat there. How do I, what do I project tourism will be this summer? Um, I think tourism industry will be uh, quite strong in Ireland from a domestic market point of view. Um, I am concerned about some of the, the national challenges we have there about rising labor costs, about rising supply costs, um, and about the challenges with Ukraine and hotel occupancy as well. Um, I, th I think we are in danger of gaining a reputation of being a expensive place to visit. And that's not something that we want to, uh, to get at the moment. We want to remain good value and we want to be perceived as good value across Europe. So I project that tourism will be um, lucrative for the industry this year, but I hope that they don't use it as an opportunity to cash in. I hope they take a long-term view on this so that they can manage revenue into the future and not just look at summer 22. So thanks for that question. How is tourism during the holiday season in December? My husband was in Dublin for work and he felt it was like a lot more locals than tourists. This is always the case. Uh, December can be quiet uh, in Dublin, but Dublin is a fairly cosmopolitan city with um, many nationalities and many transient workers there. Uh, yeah, I mean, Dublin in December, if you're at an event or if you're in the major retail places and so on, they can be very busy with tourists. But if you go there in mid-July, it can be completely packed with tourists as well. So it, you will get a very different, different um, sense of the city at the different times of year. Uh, December gone past, it's very difficult to tell how successful it was for them because they were still in a very consumer hesitant stage where people weren't really certain about, about how COVID was affecting the market. Uh, I was in Dublin myself in December, for example, and, and wasn't quite sure uh, what would be open or not. Um, even though I, you know, I work in the industry and I, I study this, uh, um, I, even I wasn't certain. So I, I can imagine for international tourists coming, there would have been great hesitancy about what, what it was going to be like. But it is a nice time to visit as well, it, although it can be wet. Thank you for the question. Any other questions from anyone? There's no other question. I would like to make a brief comment. Um, thank you, Tony, for doing this presentation. And COC is in partnership discussion with your institution for a good seven or eight months now. And I think that that conversation has been going really well. So ideally what we would like to do would be have our faculty um, interested in faculty day program to work with your institution, to bring our students and our classes to go and study with you at your institution. Um, and sorry, I missed the first part of meeting, not a meeting, I couldn't get away. So um, if you have not already, if you, can you address, they say if, our faculty are to take our students to uh, education abroad, uh, study abroad in your institution. How, um, how does your institution usually handle faculty-led programs um, with, with our study abroad students? Just kind of give us a broad overall uh, overview. Faculty-led from, from, the, from the host, from ourselves, or faculty-led from yourself? Uh, from our institution. Uh, okay, so uh, I mean, we, we are, a university that's um, more than 50 years old. Um, and I, I think as part of our culture and our national psyche, we enjoy welcoming international visitors to our campus. Um, when international visitors c come to, 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 to see us, we particularly enjoy showing off our facilities, talking about our current research, um, delivering some guest uh, classes to, to the students. Um, and where we can, we get our students to interact with, with your students as well. So that it's it's not just you know a, a kind of a lecture to student relationship. We also like to engage with you on on local cultural activities as well, and and to um you know to to I suppose bring you to some of the kind of places that I showed at the start of the presentation, some of the the interesting environmental and cultural and heritage uh, attractions that we we would have. Um, you know, we, we often, I suppose, work with visiting people as well to design something quite specific if there's a particular area that they're, they're interested in focusing in on. Um, and I suppose the, the, the intention always is to, to make it be a meaningful relationship so that we can follow up with a reciprocal visit um, afterwards as well. Perfect. And I have a follow-up question. Sure. So anyone, right, anyone who wants to visit Ireland, 
So without spending a fortune, <laughs> however you develop fortune is, how long do you usually recommend people to be in your country in a way that's meaningful, not just like in one spot, you know, here and then one day there, like kind of um, very quick, it's just as a survey, kind of more as a deep, deeper understanding of Ireland, culture, people, and history. How will you recommend that? Like, a week, 10 days, two weeks, and why is your commenting? Uh, why do you recommend the way it is? Yeah, so it's a really good question. Uh, I think one of the global movements in tourism now is around slow tourism, and it's around getting off the beaten track and slowing everything down and having a deep immersive experience somewhere. So if you come to Ireland, Ireland is not Dublin, you know, and, and Dublin is a, is a great city, and I, I, just, I live one hour away from it, and it has our, our most visited attractions and it has our best access routes and it has our best value in hotels. And it, but it's a big capital city and it's not a deep immersive experience in Ireland. To truly get that understanding of Irish culture and Irish hospitality, you need to go into the smaller towns. And I would recommend to do that using public transport or better still, get a bike, use our national greenway network, cycle or use our rivers uh, or canals uh, and you will it's a, it's unavoidable if you go that way that you would meet locals interact with local people and get a real understanding for the history and culture and heritage now it takes time to do that properly you're looking at a few weeks you know you need to really immerse yourself and go slow and make sure you absorb the food and the culture and the music and so on that's not practical for everyone, though. So if someone comes for a minimum of a week, they can get a really good understanding. But it's like anywhere. The longer you visit, the more you'll you'll absorb. And it's a country with many different regions and different personalities and landscapes as well, much like the United States. You know, you, no two parts are comparable, you know. Uh, and we have the same here. We have cities that are about culture and music and heritage. And then we have rural areas that are about wildlife and wilderness and um, rurality. Uh, and then we have places like Northern Ireland, which is very much about, I suppose, shared shared and differing identities and politics and so on. So we, we have all these different stories. And it depends which story you want to immerse yourself in. I also have a, a question. Um, well, one, I would say I, I have been to Ireland. I, I didn't go into Dublin. I was, I was in my 20s. I actually flew into Shannon because the flight was cheaper. So we got, uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see Dublin now, but um, given my original experience, I think I, maybe not what you're saying, I got um, maybe more rural uh, view. But uh, an earlier presentation, or a presentation earlier this week talked about um, how the tourist industry, the demographics are changing as far as like who's visiting the city. Now you talked a little bit about that um, in the Florence presentation, they mentioned how uh, they used to have more families and older couples and now they're having a lot more younger uh, generation like 20s or you know early 20s, mid 20s. And so I'm wondering if that's also happening in Ireland. It's like the demographics of who's coming and how much money they're spending in the country is also changing. Yeah, so th that's a that's a really good question. We've divided our uh, we've segmented our tourism market into um, four kind of groups, um, and we've called we call them social energizers, the culturally curious, uh, the great escapers, and I can't remember the name of the fourth one, but th these each of these segments represents what our government um, perceives as being the kind of future demographic that will will i suppose purchase the irish tourism product in future uh, there is certainly um growth in the aging tourism market in ireland um, and this is because we have very strong annual leave uh, in ireland um, and we have very strong annual leave across europe we have very strong um, labor laws and, and union laws and so on we also have many countries in europe that have quite a young retirement age so in France, for example, it's in, in, I think, maybe 61, something like this. So as a result, we have this population across Europe that has lots of money um, and high disposable income uh, and lots of disposable time uh, as well. So they have good annual leave and they retire young. And as a result, we are tending to attract um, people that are 
not coming here really to, to socialize and party as much as Ireland might be perceived, but they're coming here to spend uh, time with family. They're coming to spend um, time in, in cities, learn about history uh, and experience kind of the cultural product. So we have that mix, but my, my sense is that the demographic is changing. It is getting a, to be an older uh, mm. type of tourist coming. In saying that, we've always had that to some extent. We've, we've had like one of the biggest markets for us is, is older Americans who come to trace genealogical roots. Mm. You know, every, every American, if they go back far enough, has an Irish, you know, great, 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 great granddad or something, you know. Um, so we, we do tend to attract a lot of those. And we also are a very popular location for golf. So many Americans will come here to, to, to golf um, and a very strong golf industry um, is built up around that. Um, and that, that's hugely influenced by major events as well. We're, we're hosting the Ryder Cup, for example, in 2025, um, quite near to Shannon Airport, actually, where, where you flew in. So, yeah, that, those products, genealogy and golf, tend to attract older tourists as well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, thank you again for doing this presentation. I think it was very... Um, there's a lot of information, so I, th I think it's great. I think I learned a lot. This whole week, I've had the privilege of being or sitting in the different perspectives on um, the tourist industry in Europe. Um, of course, for anyone who's here and wants to see these again, or you know, someone who registered and is seeing this, the recording, uh, we'll have it on YouTube for you to share with students, share with anyone you want. Um, but yes, yeah, once again, thank you very much. I think that might conclude our presentation. Miss uh, Dr. J, would you like to say a few words? Well, thank you. And this concludes our uh, lecture series, and we hope to do this more. And we have, ISP has extended a quiet partnership uh, in 2021 when we couldn't travel. So what we did, is we reached out to fine institutions like Tony's. And then now we have student exchange programs. You know, Marisa does wonderful presentation every Friday, and including schools like uh, Tony's University, where students can study abroad, you know, through the partnership and it will education abroad will transfer abroad. So more details, please look at ISP's website. We have done incredibly amount of, of good work, I would like to, to say that we provide students opportunity to go to some university that's tuition free. Um, for the whole semester. And I, what Tony was saying here, Professor Johnson was saying here, you really want to go there and immerse yourself even longer, right? So we strongly encourage students to consider Ireland and there were any of the lectures and the, the universities that we, we have this week to consider study abroad, education abroad for one semester, or even transfer abroad after finish with us and then go to our partner universities and then go there and finish your bachelor's program. We think if people move, the ideas will move. When the ideas move, everybody prospers. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Professor Johnson. I hope to see you soon. I believe you're coming to visit us, correct? I hope so. Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you all. Um, thank you for being here. And again, we will promote the video online. We will kind of, of course cut it down and all that and promote continuously promote the videos online. So anyone who will be interested in listening to it, we have people registered. We may not be at here right now that we'll send them the video recording. Sure. Thanks thank very you much. so much. Thank Take you. Care. Have Bye a wonderful now. evening, Professor Johnson. Okay. Thank you. Bye.